World Health Organization estimates that there are 34 million people worldwide infected with HIV. So far, no cure exists. But Andy Thorne, along with Dr. Greg Burton and his lab, are investigating this virus in the hopes of saving lives. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. This virus infects and weakens the immune system so that the body cannot as effectively defend itself from infection. HIV is a sneaky virus. After initial infection and acute sickness in the patient, the virus recedes into latency and the patient can appear mostly healthy. Over many years, HIV infects and kills T-cells. Once T-cells get low enough and HIV high enough, other infections can set in and kill the patient. While latent, HIV exists in the body in two main reservoirs. The first is in T-cells, which serve as the memory of the immune system. HIV is also stored in follicular dendritic cells, or FDCs. FDCs gather material foreign to the body and hold it on their surface, which triggers an immune response. Normally, this system keeps you healthy, but in the case of HIV, FDCs present the virus to its prime target, T-cells. This inadvertently speeds up the infection of T-cells, assisting in the spread of infection. As they investigate the interactions of FDCs, HIV, and T-cells, Dr. Burton's lab hopes to better understand the FDC reservoir and ultimately find ways to block FDCs from assisting in HIV infection in order to eradicate the FDC-HIV reservoir. When you blog about your son's diagnosis, post to Facebook about your last migraine, or tweet about your diet and exercise, you may be affecting others' attitudes and even their medical decisions. Social media is changing the landscape of public health as people without medical backgrounds talk about health. This raises important questions about the information that is out there, its accuracy, and how it spreads. Scott Burton and his fellow researchers in the Data Mining Lab are researching new ways to find and analyze health data in social media. By analyzing communities of mommy bloggers, Burton is tracking the spread of health content among these users. Using Twitter, he is discovering people who are asking health questions and the answers they are receiving. By looking for patterns in their tweets, Burton is finding individuals who may be most susceptible to certain conditions and determining how to best interact with them in a personalized way. From studying sand dunes in Egypt to watching modern carbonate deposition in the Bahamas, geology has taken Stephen Phillips all over the world. Yet Stephen says that no place has filled him with as much awe as Utah's very own Colorado Plateau. After experiencing the towering cliffs of Navajo sandstone at Zion National Park and seeing the amazing water pocket fold in Capitol Reef, he knew that he wanted his thesis to involve fieldwork in this area. When the Navajo sandstone was deposited, Utah looked much like the present-day Sahara Desert. Over time, deposition in this sand sea ceased, and erosion took over, creating the eroded surface on top of the Navajo sandstone called the J1, or Jurassic 1 unconformity. After this erosional period, deposition began again with an interior seaway in Utah called the Carmel Seaway. Shoreward of this seaway, dunes began to form again. These rocks, marine and dune, are preserved in the rock record as the Temple Cap Formation, Carmel Formation, and Page Sandstone. Through his thesis research, Phillips is working to find differences in the chemistry of the Navajo Sandstone, Temple Cap Formation, and Page Sandstone, so that the J1 unconformity can be located with confidence. There are only five sets of numbers that add up to four, shown here. These sums are the partitions of 4. For larger numbers, the number of partitions grows rapidly. The number 20 has 627 partitions, and the number 100 has nearly 2 million. Mathematicians have been working for centuries to find an efficient way to calculate these values, but each step forward in speed results in even more complex and unwieldy algorithms. Recently, doctors Ken Ono and Jan Brunier discovered new, surprising properties of partitions. With this discovery, they've developed a short, elegant formula to calculate how many partitions a given number has. Using this formula, BYU student Chris Hedinger and Dr. Paul Jenkins of the BYU Math Department are now working to develop a new algorithm that can calculate extremely large partition numbers efficiently.
Learning the multiplication tables from 0 to 12 is a big feat for a 10-year-old. But what if students could learn math while playing a game? Lorraine Hansen, a secondary math teacher and graduate student from the Department of Mathematics Education, is investigating the use of computer-assisted instruction as an avenue to help elementary students increase their multiplication skills and academic confidence. To study the value of computer-assisted instruction, Hansen is looking at Times Attack, an interactive 3D computer game. Times Attack was designed to help motivate students at varying academic levels to understand and master basic multiplication facts. Since the game is internet-based, students can play it at home and at school. The game also lets teachers monitor students' progress as well as how much time they spend practicing. Lorraine is testing and interviewing over 200 third and fourth graders to see how their abilities and attitudes change when they practice with Times Attack versus working with a teacher. When her research is complete, Hansen hopes to better understand to what degree computer-assisted instruction can improve academic outcomes and attitudes by providing students with a more motivational and less stressful learning environment where they can evaluate themselves. People serving in the military are often exposed to high levels of noise, which can lead to significant hearing loss. Those who work near jets may experience sound levels exceeding 150 decibels. This is like being surrounded by 1,000 rock concert loudspeakers. Alan Wall and Kent Gee of the BYU Acoustics Research Group, in cooperation with the Air Force Research Laboratory, are trying to better understand jet noise by measuring and analyzing the sound of an F-22 Raptor. Using precision microphones, they recorded sound pressures in more than 6,000 locations near the jet. They are applying a technique called acoustical holography to visualize jet noise at its source. Just like an optical hologram uses light waves to create a three-dimensional image of an object on a flat surface, an acoustic hologram uses a measurement of sound waves over a flat surface to predict the three-dimensional sound field. By understanding the sources of jet noise, aircraft designers hope to be able to reduce that noise and to preserve the hearing of military personnel. The first step to controlling air pollution is knowing where it comes from, whether it be industry, automobile traffic, natural processes, or something else entirely. Jonathan Christensen and Professor William Christensen of the Department of Statistics are working on applying advanced statistical methods to this problem. By separating measured air pollution concentrations into several distinct sources, these statistical methods can help inform environmental policy. With funding from Wisconsin Focus on Energy, the BYU Environmental Statistics Group is developing new approaches to this problem that consider pollution measurements from multiple nearby locations, where past approaches have considered only one set of measurements. In addition, they are working on quantifying and understanding the effect of weather patterns on measured pollution levels. For example, some weather patterns may increase or decrease the amount of pollution measured from a certain source. Accounting for these effects also allows more accurate estimation of the pollution sources themselves. Understanding where air pollution is coming from can help citizens and local governments make informed decisions about environmental issues, improving the overall quality of life.